What's going on, arcade nerds? Um, in this video, in this video, I want to talk about Starhawk. Now, Starhawk, in my opinion, is an important part of uh, Vector arcade machine history. Um, but before I talk about Starhawk, I need to talk about Cinematronics, and I need to talk about Tim Skelly, which was the, the which was the designer of uh, Starhawk. Um, so, let me, let me, first, let me talk about Cinematronics. Okay. Um, what kind of started the arcade industry, some people call it Space Invaders, but really it was Pong. Uh, Pong came out, and it was a hit. It was great. Everyone liked it. And so many companies came out of nowhere, and they cloned Pong. They did different types of clone Pong. They tried to, they tried to, you know, make more paddles, less paddles, you know, and do all different kinds of variants of Pong, okay? And that was like the Pong clone genre, I guess you could say. Well, around 1976, 1977, um, around this time, Pong clones were getting old. Everyone's seen it before. It's not new. No one cares. You know, it was getting old. And um, so Cinematronics, they, need, they needed the next big hit, or Cinematronics was, was going to be in trouble. And so a guy by the name of Larry, Larry Rosenthal showed up to Cinematronics, and he said, Hey, I have this new circuit board. And this circuit board can play Space Wars. Now, uh, Space Wars was was no, was known by a lot of people in the gaming industry um, it, because it was really awesome graphics. But the problem was, it ran on a giant computer. It was it was originally originally ran on the PDP-1 computer system, which um, took about half a room. And so, as time goes by, around this time there was the PDP-8 which would have been the, the latest PDP model. It was still pretty huge and extremely expensive. There's no way you're going to put that inside an arcade machine. But it played a really cool game called Space Wars, right? Well, uh, Tim Skelly uh, brought this board. He said, hey, look, this is like a PDP clone. It, uh, it, will, it, it will play Space Wars and so on. And, you know, and, and to put things into, into perspective, um, and this was a great thing for Simutronics. This is a great thing. Oh, by the way, he, um, he, he struck up one hell of a deal. He got 50% of the profit from Cinematronics because he, he brought this magic board. He says, man, this is going to be the board. Well, anyways, to put things in perspective, um, computers back then um, were a lot of them were still running punch cards. Okay? Um, and, and you were lucky if you, had, if you had floppy disks. You know what I mean? If you, you know, you, it would be you'd be the top dog if you had floppy disks. The problem was, uh, floppy disks looked like this back in the day. <laughs> and if you wanted to read them, you needed a, a floppy disk drive about this big, okay? And um, all, that, all that technology, just, it just you really couldn't, it wasn't feasible to put all that inside an arcade cabinet. So this magic board that, that Larry brought in was was the key to help Cinematronics. The problem was Larry left the company and um, he took all of the software with him. He took all of the technical specs of the board with him. Okay, And so they brought in Tim Skelly, who's a programmer, and they said, uh, hey, can you figure this out? And Tim says, no, I can't figure this out. I'm not an engineer, I'm a programmer. And so they ended up finding a guy that had helped Tim Skelly with, with his board before. And this guy ended up having all the technical specs for the board so Tim could actually program it. Because Larry kind of left left the company and kind of left them high and dry. Okay. Luckily they were able to recover all the data they need. They were going to reverse engineer the entire board and go through it and figure it out the hard way. Okay. But so eventually uh, Tim Skilly was at was hard at work programming the very first game of his own and the very second game that was Vector for Cinematronics, um, which was Starhawk. But Tim Skelly didn't stop there. I, I mean, he went off and he did Warrior. Uh, he did, what else? Uh, Star Castle, um, Armor Attack, uh, and others. Um, oh, and, and then eventually he left to work for, Reac uh, for, work for Gottlieb and made Reactor. Um, 
And all those vector games, they all ran off the exact same board. Oh, I had one sitting out. See that board? It's a CCPU. I, I got boards all over the top of games everywhere. Not over here. <laughs> you know what? Did you put it in there? Well, I might have. Yeah! There it is. There we go. <laughs> Anyways, all those vector games ended up running on that same board that ran Space Wars. Um, this board carried Simmetronics through several years. They reused this same exact board. Now, when Tim, now when Larry designed this board, um, this was, I mean, it must have been around 76, 77, probably around 76 when he designed it. Maybe even older, I don't know. But around that time period, I mean, the, the, the only feasible processor would have been like the 8080. Like, you can get your hands on a nice 8080 processor. The problem was they were very expensive. And so, um, what, what Larry did is he designed this board without a microprocessor. There's no microprocessor on this board, which was, you know, primitive at the time. Very primitive board. But you don't need, it turns out, you don't need that much of a complicated board to run vector graphics, okay? Uh, especially black and white vector graphics, you know. Um, yeah, but instead of a microprocessor, he used three ALU chips, which stand for arithmetic logic units. So in other words, it could perform mathematical operations with these chips. And the rest of the CPU is kind of glue logic all put together, okay? But uh, so, let's play some Starhawk. And I, I want to show you guys what it looks like on the inside and all that. It's a really, it's a wonderful piece of history. It's a wonderful piece of engineering. It's, um, you know, it's close to my heart. It really is. I love all these vectors, and I love the Cinematronics vectors a lot too. But, all right, let's try it out. Okay, before we actually do any gameplay, I think I might show you the cabinet. The cabinets outside, the cabinets inside, and so on. Um, this is the artwork. Now, keep in mind, this is not the best looking Star Starhawk. In fact, this Starhawk is probably the ugliest game in my arcade. It's, it's, it's very rough. Matter of fact, uh, this is a combination of two different Starhawks. I've had two different Starhawks, and um, this cabinet was, was very bad. Me and Kelly had to put a whole new bottom in this Starhawk. Um, and so, you know, oh, also, here's an interesting piece of info. Whether this is true or not, this is something I read online, okay? That you see how small the base is on Starhawk, and you see how large the top is? And it actually leans forward a little bit. Um, the story goes is that these were top heavy and they liked to knock over on the players. So uh, operators would put cinder blocks inside the cabinet on the bottom right there, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and since mostly of the electronics in a Cinematronics vector game were mounted to the side, it, you know, there, there, would, there would have been room for uh, cinder blocks. But interesting thing, um, yes, it did have a tiny base and a large top. Uh, so let me show you what the insides look like a little bit. Okay, this is the back of the cabinet. I had the back door off. Now keep in mind, um, this was a very rotten bottom on this cabinet. And the, the whole bottom had some water damage and uh, I know those 2x4s aren't supposed to be there, but I put them there because I just to add some stability to this cabinet because it was, it was pretty much falling apart. And, uh, and you know, when I got this machine it was actually in very very bad condition uh, which it still is <laughs> but at least it's solid now um, now first let me talk about my monitor here um, this is not the original monitor that came in it although although yes it is in some ways it's it's the same exact monitor but a slightly different revision this is uh, this is actually somewhat of a Frankenstein this is a mixture of a Keltron monitor and uh, and a mixture of the onboard flyback monitor um, See, this monitor came a different way. See, they, they had different ways to mount and different frames for the um, um, heat sinks here, right? Well, this, this heat sink is mounted like this. Other monitors had the heat sinks mounted on the side. And some monitors had a metal cage that encased the flyback. And other monitors had a high voltage box that was on the side. Now, actually, actually, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but this box right here, uh, Cinematronics found out um, that some hospital supply equipment surplus 
um, uh, it had the same voltages voltages as the monitor as the monitor that it, that they designed. So that's actually repurposed hospital equipment that came from the from the factory. Now let's let's talk about the Cinematronics power supply. Now in my case, I added a modern day switching power supply, even though my original five volts from the linear power supply here was good. And the reason the reason I did that, oh by the way, it's a simple simple modification. Um, you desolder one wire and then you add two wires to to this board, and I could put it back easily without any permanent damage whatsoever. And I like I like to have this more modern power supply on these cinematronics. Because in my in my uh, experience, I've seen a lot of the of the uh, five volts uh, run away on this on this uh, um, power supply, and I don't want the regulator to fail and shoot you know ten volts to through the board. So I just have it this way. Uh, some people uh, are are against this, but uh, and I, I I'm a, I'm a purist myself. I really am. But in this situation, um, I like to have a switcher. Not not all of my not all of my cinematronics have it, but this one does. Now, this has two two breakers, breaker right here, and a breaker right here. Okay. Now, often, if this board were to malfunction, it would send goofy data through this ribbon cable to the DACs. Now, on this board, there's two chips called your DACs. Here's one right here. And there's another one to the other one. Now, all, all a DAC is, is DAC, is Digital to Analog Converter. It gets the digital data from this ribbon cable and converts it to an analog signal, which is the signal you see displayed on the screen. Okay? Well, anyways, if this board were to malfunction, it would send a goofy, goofy data to this DAC. And what usually happens when these DACs get goofy data it'll slam the beam clear off the screen and hold it there okay well the problem with that is uh, if, if you were to have if you have your uh, driver transistors drive the yoke hard left or hard right or hard up or hard down um, these transistors can fry okay and along with other components on the board and and just while it does that it just so happens to pull a lot of current and so if it were to pull a lot of current the breaker down here would pop and and instead of damaging the monitor now some people bypass this and that's really stupid don't ever bypass these breakers you can put fuses in their place now I believe those are two three amp uh, breakers but you do not want to put three amp fuses in there you want to put uh, four amp fuses in place of that if you ever do that um, yeah, because it's really four amps when they when they actually trigger even though they we know they're rated to three amps um, now, something unusual about this is, this power supply puts out pl plus 25, negative 25 volts, and 5 volts, okay? I have my 5 volts bypassed here, but the monitor uses plus 25 and minus 25, and there's, there's onboard regulators all across this monitor, which get 5 volt, plus and minus 18 volt, plus and minus 15 volt, you know, that depends, that varies on your specific make of the monitor as well. But, um, and you get 25 volts going to your soundboard, this board right here. Now, this, d d depending, on, depending on which soundboard, I believe this one does plus and minus 18 volts to the uh, amplifier, which is very odd. You know, the, the only other machine that I could think of would be some universals that have odd voltages like that. I believe some universals take, take 22 volts and Gottlieb on, like, Hubert and Reactor and all that, they take 30 volts. And they actually power a 27 volt chip with it, <laughs> and so on. Kind of an odd voltage, and 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 to be honest, it's actually a common failure with these. Um, the two drive transistors fail, and I, you know, personally, I would have drove it with, with one single 12 volt line or something like that, but that's just how they did it. Um, yeah, and so you have you have a ribbon cable that goes right here, and you can follow that all the way to the control panel. In the front okay and obviously this ribbon cable is going to the monitor and then you have one more ribbon cable which is not required for the game to boot but this ribbon cable goes from here to the soundboard now uh, one important thing you could think about on a cinematronics cinematronics uh, board is 
Um, let me try to zoom in. I'm going to zoom in really good. Now, I don't know if you can see that, but there's an LED right there. Okay. Now, Starhawk, this is, this is not the original board. That, that this, that this was probably a Star Castle board or something like that. And I converted it to play Starhawk. Okay. Now, um, the earlier revisions of this board did not have that LED. And the later revisions did have the LED. And something you want to know is if you have a Synetronics vector game that's not working properly, you can uh, turn the game on and watch that LED. If the LED flashes for a half a second and then shuts off, that usually means that the CCPU board right here is operating normally. But if that LED flashes and stays on, that means you have a CCPU error. Some sort of error and the game board is not working properly. And obviously, you will not get a picture to your monitor if that board is not working. So, just an interesting tidbit there for you. Um, you know what? The controls are absolutely terrible. Um, let, I have a spare Starhawk control panel. I'm going to dig it out of the basement and I'm going to show you how terrible, how terrible the joysticks are. Okay, let me talk about what I consider terrible joysticks. Okay, now I'll show you gameplay in a minute. Okay, but uh, you have you have a crosshatch and you want to shoot that crosshatch at you want to shoot uh, ships that are on the screen, right? And when you shoot, you use this button right here. Okay, and you use this joystick to um, uh, move the crosshatch across the screen. Now this joystick feels very unsatisfying. It feels broken. It feels terrible. That's just my opinion. It just it absolutely feels terrible. And when you play the game, you have three options. Let me zoom in on this. Your sight control, you can, while gameplay is happening, you can pick slow. And when you move the joystick, you really can't get everything. Medium, which is where I like to keep it. Still a little slow sometimes. Or while you while you're playing, you can you can decide to pick fast, which is so damn fast you can't play the game. So the controls are terrible. They're absolutely terrible. And um, that's just my opinion. Now let me flip this over. Let me show you this monstrosity on the back of here. Okay. It looks to me, it looks to me like these joysticks were handmade at the, from random crap they got at the hardware store. It really does. I mean, this, this, I mean, look at this. You can see where they marked it. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but you can see where they marked it to cut it. So it looks like, it, you know, to me, they had like a shop going at, at Cinematronics where they got bolts and washers and a piece of steel and they, it looks like they made their own joysticks in-house uh, very terrible joysticks they're very unsatisfying and they're very picky um, and uh, you know um, a lot of you guys are probably common are probably familiar with the common Wicco sticks the Wicco stick you know it, it has a shaft that clearly moves and, and the, uh, the contacts easily pick up that movement there's very little movement underneath here so all the contacts need to be really close and so you can get that bare, that terrible slight movement to just just hit all the contacts. And because you have to keep, keep them so damn close, it's not uncommon for them to stick and whatever. It's just a terrible, terrible joystick. Now, this ribbon cable is what plugs into the Symmetronic CCPU board. Okay, now, that ribbon cable goes all the way to the back here. And it has, okay, the ribbon cable goes all the way to here. It has this breakout board. And that breakout board will, will uh, you know, connect to all the controls. One interesting thing about some of these Cinematronics games is they have so many damn buttons on the control panel on some of these. Space Wars, for example, Sundance is another good example, a million buttons. <coughs> this game has a million buttons. Let's see here, it has three, four, five, six, seven eight buttons on this one and two joysticks but there's you know for example Sundance has nine uh, 18 20 20 to 22 23 
something like that. Uh, that. That's a lot of buttons for a control panel, you know what I mean? And it's kind of confusing in my opinion, but um, what, what a unique piece of, piece of hardware. What, what a crazy, complicated setup they did for a control panel back then. Okay, let's go over to the real machine, the full built working machine, and let's play a couple, a couple games. You know, uh, right now, Kelly is moving, he's turning the game around and putting the back door on. And um, there's something I, I, I wanted to mention, which is kind of uh, unusual for an arcade machine. Kind of smart, too. Um, the buttons on these, by the way, take a good look at these buttons. Did any of you computer guys know uh, if, if this was shared on a typewriter or a computer? Because I need some of these buttons. And I don't want to kill this for to get all my buttons either. But um, these these uh, buttons, the way it works is there's a small magnet behind this key, and you press the key and you move a magnet, okay? And there's a little glass tube with a a, re a relay, a switch inside, and when you move that button down, the metal will attract to the other terminal. So it's a completely, um, the switch itself is never actually touched. It's actually a great, great design. You know, I, I, um, a lot of people complain because these, these, uh, they, they do eventually fail. They do. And I have a trick, I have a trick on how to fix these. It's really not that bad. Get a powerful neodymium magnet, okay? And flip it around on top of the keys. And it'll, it'll actually separate those contacts. But if if it's if it's uh, if this was, was stuck down for a while, I suppose maybe they would get stuck. I don't understand how they fail. Maybe they maybe they there's a little bit of air inside the tube and they corrode. I don't know. But if you get a, a strong neodymium magnet and flip it around, you can actually clean the internal contacts. But uh, okay, it looks like Kelly has moved the game, so let's go over there and let's play. Let's play. Well, there's Starhawk. Um, there's a couple chips I have in this marquee, and I actually have a perfect marquee. I need to I need to swap that marquee over to this cabinet. I just never did it yet. Um, but yeah, let me uh, show you some of the artwork. By the way, Tim Skelly drew all of this artwork himself. Tim Skelly was also an artist, and he did uh, artwork for many of his games in, in other games. But okay, let me hook up the, uh, let me turn some lights off here, and let's hook up the tripod, and let's play some Starhawk. Okay, now we have the tripod set up. Now, first off, before I even start the game, does this game look familiar to you? Does it perhaps remind you of a, any movies? Or, better yet, does it remind you of this? Well, you know, this was the, that time period. I mean, I think Star Wars came out, what, maybe 1976, was it? Maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Uh, and this was made in 77, so, you know, Star Wars was, was a pretty hot thing at the time still. But, okay, so let me start. I'm going to press one player. Okay. Now move my joystick. I'm going to select medium speed. Now watch my score in the top right. Eventually, a spaceship will try to steal my... It'll take away your score. See it? Little bastard. And if you shoot it, you can have your score back. Very difficult to control this. Very difficult. Now, I, I may have my information crossed, but I thought they were eventually going to make this an analog stick game, unless I'm thinking of Warrior. So he took my score. Took my jab. Very difficult. And, and you're basically timed. See that in the center of the screen, the top, um, there's a clock ticking down. Very, very difficult to control. And if I were, were to select two players, because two people can play at once in this game, 
Um, the two player two crosshatch looks different. Yep, and that's it. Okay, let's recap. Cinematronics had Pong clones that nobody wanted anymore. Larry came on the scene and said, hey, check out this new board. Then Space Wars happened. Then Larry quit. Tim came on the scene. And then Starhawk, Warrior, Star Castle, Armor Attack, Ripoff, Tail Gunner, Sundance, War of the Worlds. But it all started with Starhawk. Well, that's it, guys. Uh, Happy New Year, by the way. This is New Year's Day. Um, uh, don't forget to subscribe and um, uh, give me a like if you can. And, uh, you know, have a good one.